it's great to get a chance to do a, a sneak preview. What I'm going to try to do is squeeze an awful lot in, into this uh, short space. But I want to start off by acknowledging my colleagues in the project, uh, first and foremost, Claudia and Annika, uh, but also our colleagues at the Resilience Center with whom we share the, the overall project. So just a couple of words about the project. Uh, it's in its second phase. Started off as a Swedish initiative. Uh, without a co-chair. Uh, along the way, we picked up the United States as a co-chair, which uh, the timing for that works really well for us because it allows us to deliver the report in the, at the end of a, a chairmanship that's very uh, consistent in terms of its values and goals with what the Arctic Resilience Report uh, is, is seeking to do. Our interim report was delivered in 2013. Uh, Final scientific report, as Claudia says, is, uh, is going to be ready in September. And our final synthesis that includes some policy recommendations or policy rele relevant insights will be delivered to the ministerial in 2000. It's actually uh, 18. No, 2017. That's right. Good. No mistakes in the slide yet. So let me, let me start with, uh, with just a couple of general statements, that, things that we've identified in this report overall. I don't think these will come as a surprise, but one of these is that we see a clear sort of speeding up of the rate of change in the Arctic. So in th this is really difficult for humans to, uh, to manage. It's hard enough to deal with change itself, but when the rate of change is changing, uh, it's, it's very difficult to, to keep track of. And we see that both in terms of uh, the social side and in terms of the the, the swings and normal variations going outside of the norms that people are accustomed to. An important part of this is the interconnectedness. Uh, and as we learn more and more about the, the scientific, uh, about the, the, the sort of natural world's interconnectedness, how different, uh, how ice is connected to, uh, you know, to, the, to the rest of the planet, we also learn that th there are s important social components to that. So even as we begin to understand that much more clearly, uh, we see that these social connections, this is just one example, are intensifying. For example, uh, the opening up of the, uh, the sea ice in the north makes it much more possible to, to think about and, and begin to test the opportunities for shipping. But that's one of a, a whole range of, of options. Uh, the RexX project deals with one of these. Uh, resource extraction in the north as the snow and ice disappears. Uh, but tourism and, and other kinds of activities are, are expanding very rapidly, and those have an impact, a local impact on the Arctic, but it's also part of this global impact on what's happening in the, in the Arctic. So that brings us to the, to the basic frame that we use for this report, uh, this social ecological systems framework. And the reason for picking this uh, this image here is a lot of the images we see of the Arctic are these really dramatic shots of ice and snow uh, and sometimes polar bears or other wildlife. But it's a lot less often than we see the humans in the system. Uh, and fundamentally, the Arctic Resilience Report is about, is about us, whether, whether it's humans outside of the Arctic or people who've called the Arctic home for, for generations or for even thousands of, of years about the effects of Arctic change on us and how we feed into those, those kinds of changes. And this is, the, this is the basic sort of a schematic of the, of the model, this social ecological systems framework. Uh, what's interesting is a lot of the discussion about resilience and social ecological systems tends, tends to home in on one side of the system or the other side of the system. And that has consequences for the way that um, the resilience is talked about. I'll come to that in just a moment. The second property with this social ecological systems framework uh, is that it's multi-scalar. So for example, some of what we're investigating, governance, uh, sits up here, but it impacts what happens down below that scale. It's also influenced by the global agreements that, that uh, create the context in which the Arctic Council and other, other bodies are, are taking action. And it certainly sets a context for local communities that are trying to manage the kinds of changes that are, that are coming, coming at them. 
So this is one of the issues I have to say uh, that I've struggled with a lot because resilience is appears to be everywhere. Its use has exploded over the last three or four years, certainly since I've been involved in this project. And and you find that it that people mean different things when they talk about resilience. Uh, so very often, this is a fairly standard definition, the capacity of a system to absorb disturbance and reorganize, but essentially keep the same functions. The, the variation of that I like is a Timex watch ad that I grew up with, takes a licking and keeps on ticking, uh, which essentially it's the capacity to just to keep on rolling despite lots of disturbances. But the problem with that is that it, it, it speaks quite nicely to the ecosystem side, but it misses the essential component on the social side, and that's agency. It's our capacity to learn from our experience, to take that knowledge and put it to work, and use it to steer our choices, uh, so that we, ideally, we we avoid the big pitfalls and uh, and adjust continually as we go. So this is a definition that's much more similar to what you see in the disaster risk reduction work or in the, the UN or the Sendai framework, where it really focuses on human agency, on our capacity to, to learn, to steer forward, to adapt to, to change, or even to transform some fundamental aspects of what we do while still holding on to what's most important. And our definition of resilience, uh, well, it's, it's these two combined, which means it's too long to read in this, this kind of a time frame, really combines both of those so that we capture both sides of this and most essentially, we capture the agency part. One of the uh, one of the essential elements of this framework is that we look at change in a nonlinear fashion. So they're thresholds, and the the tricky thing about the thresholds this gets a little blurry here, uh, but is that they're most easy to identify when they're behind you, um, and that's part of what we're worried about in the Arctic, because we in this report have identified essentially 18 regime shifts or thresholds that, that science believes that we're either in the midst of passing or may already be behind us. Some of these are pretty familiar. Loss of sea ice uh, is, is one. Diminishing quite rapidly, you'll hear a lot of reports about, I think this year is the lowest level of sea ice recorded so far. And what this analysis looks at is, is the driving forces feeding into that change, and then the impacts coming out of the change, which in some instances create feedbacks that actually reinforce that entire loop. And this is just one of these 18, one of the simpler ones, I would say, but a really important feedback loop. This is similarly, you see climate changes down here, but that it's a more complex set of changes in part because not only are we upstream in this question, but we're also we're also adopting uh, more and more um, uh, efficient and effective technologies for for uh, harvesting fish, which has impacts on the fish populations. And of course, there are impacts that come out of that that also that also feed back. The tricky uh, this is not a shot from the Arctic. We, although I, I do think there are places where you see traffic jams, but. The, the trick here is that when we look at the drivers of change in the Arctic, uh, some of these drivers are fairly predictable. But when you put them together uh, and you put them together with the feedbacks, the, the eventual outcome is very difficult to, to predict. And with the kinds of changes taking place in the Arctic, what we know is that it's difficult to identify the thresholds and exactly where those changes are going, going to occur is going to be very, very difficult to predict. Thanks. One of, uh, and one of these sort of examples of these unexpected developments uh, that uh, is actually pretty frightening is that, uh, have you all read that the axis that the Earth spins on is shifting because of the loss of ice mass on Greenland? So if you took a top, spun it, and then you picked it up, stuck a piece of chewing gum on it, and spun it again, you'd find it wobbled differently. And that's what the Earth is doing as a result of the, the loss of this mass. And I, I, people may have expected it. Maybe that's why they're doing the research. But, but um, the the real challenge there is there there are other surprises in all likelihood. So the uh, the social side of this, and this is what I'll wrap up with, is uh, uh, 
looks at uh, comparative case studies spread across the Arctic, 25 different cases, that look at cases where we see resilience, where we see successful adaptation or even transformational change, or where we see loss of resilience. And those are analyzed for factors that are known to contribute to resilience. And I'll summarize this very uh, briefly, but what we see here is consistent with case studies actually around the world looking at resilience, and it's the capacity for self-organization or for, for people at a given scale to come together, decide on a set of problems, and how to respond to them. That's the single most important element in their uh, capacity to successfully respond. Where that's undermined from above by too restrictive uh, rule structures or by their own inability to pull together uh, this uh, the result is much more likely to be uh, loss of resilience or even, even failure. And then the final point is we have these decision structures at all scales. Uh, and in particular, we have the Arctic Council sitting here at the pan-Arctic level, but it is it sits within a larger context, and it's also influenced by what happens up and, up and down the scale. So thanks for the chance to give this uh, quick preview, and I'll... Uh, We'll look forward to being able to deliver the whole uh, hardcover version of the report. Thanks.